So without further ado, I'm going to introduce today's uh, presenters and speakers. Uh, I'll start with Brian Lamoureux. Uh, Brian is a partner with Pannone, Lopes, Devereaux, and O'Gara. He's a member of the firm's employment, litigation, cyber law, and corporate and business teams. His extensive practice areas include complex commercial litigation, employment law, construction law, social media law, and creditors' rights. In addition to being an accomplished business litigator, he is a frequent guest speaker, published author, and broad broadcast commentator on cybersecurity and social and digital media legal issues in the news, having made appearances on WPRI, WJAR, WPRO, MYRI, and New England Cable News. He also created and teaches an MBA-level course called Digital and Social Media in the Business Environment at his alma mater, Providence College, where he is the faculty member and recipient of the 2019 Teaching Excellence Award for Practitioner Faculty. In 2011, Brian was honored for his achievements by the Providence Business News with a 40 Under 40 Award. Uh, from Compass IT Compliance, we have Derek Bozanowski who will be presenting. Derek is the VP of IT Audit with Compass IT Compliance and has spent over 20 years of IT experience in a variety of vertical markets, including financial services, higher education, and state and local government. Prior to joining Compass, Derek was the VP of Technology for a credit union in Massachusetts with approximately $700 million in assets under management. With an MBA in technology management, as well as industry-leading certifications, such as being a certified information systems auditor and qualified security assessor, Derek works with clients of all sizes and in all vertical markets to help them identify gaps in their IT security strategies and provide relevant, attainable solutions to ultimately mitigate their overall risk. Derek has spoken at numerous conferences throughout his career and across the country, including the Fiserv National Conference and New York Bankers Association Annual Meeting, and is recognized as a thought leader in the field of information technology and information security. So welcome aboard, gentlemen. Um, the format for today's webinar is going to be a little different than probably most people are used to. It's not going to be necessarily presentation-based, rather it's going to be question-based. So I'll pose a question and then we'll allow Derek and Brian to provide their feedback um, based on their areas of expertise uh, to these, these different questions. And again, I've reiterated this a couple times, I'll say it again, if you folks have any questions that you would like answered at the end of the webinar, please make sure you put them in the Q&A section on the bottom and we'll make sure to get to those uh, as time permits. So we'll start with the first question here. The first question that we that we have is employees have been fighting for decades to improve their working conditions and privacy rights in the workplace. What effect is today's pandemic having on that progress? And Brian, we'll start with you. Sure. Thank you, Jeff. Well, thanks everyone for joining. I appreciate you taking time out of your day. Uh, I know everyone's busy and you have other things to do. So I appreciate you taking an hour with us. Uh, before I answer the question about the impact the pandemic uh, is having on privacy rights in the workplace, let me tell you where I come from very briefly on, on what we're going to talk about for the hour. Uh, I, I represent mostly companies. So when I look at employee questions and employee rights questions, I usually come at it and have to attack it from the employer standpoint. Um, this is the, I'm, in, I'm looking forward to today because I get to put a different hat on and come at it through the lens of the employee and what it, and I, as an employee myself, what is the effect that I'm seeing in the workplace uh, on, on our rights as employees? So big picture answer, Jeff, to your question. Uh, what impact am I seeing in the last 90 to 100 days? Uh, the, the phrase I would use is that desperate times are calling for desperate measures. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you have a work environment with 15% to 20% unemployment, uh, I think many of us on this webinar and many of us in our work life are just thankful to have jobs because I know where I felt, you know, 90 days ago in, in early to mid March, uh, I, I thought all my work would dry up. I thought that uh, you know the, the the desire or the need for legal work for the things that I do would dry up, and to the contrary, <laughs> I haven't been as busy as I've been in the last ninety days, uh, just because of these issues. And and I've been very blessed and fortunate, but I've been seeing uh, an erosion, I think, through no ill intent or bad design 
of uh, employees' rights and the protections that they've earned over the years. For example, uh, this blurring of the line between the work and home life that has just been completely obliterated since mid-March, I think is bad for employees. I think that uh, there, there is something about the dignity of the human person of leaving your office, leaving your work behind, turning your phone off, and going home and being with yourself or with your family and your loved ones, uh, that, that's necessary, I think, for employees to be energized and charged and good workers. That's been obliterated. The fact that we're Zooming, Jeff, you're Zooming from your basement right now. Uh, you know, and Derek, you're at home uh, or in an office Zooming as well. That I think long-term is gonna be a bad precedent for employees because it gives employers the excuse hey, you know, we invested all this remote technology during the pandemic. So why don't you jump on that call on Saturday and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll see you on Saturday and we can go over the report together. That's what I worry about uh, most immediately uh, in terms of employees' rights. As far as privacy goes, uh, and, and it's, a, uh, it's, it's evolving. Uh, I, I'm seeing a uh, an erosion, I think, in uh, that line and that, um, uh, sort of perspective of separation that we used to have with our employees, uh, especially with relating to health issues. It would be unthinkable in early March to ask the questions that we can now ask our employees each morning, right? About where they've been, who they've been in contact with. Let me, you know, have you, have you, do you have any of these symptoms? That road has been paved by the government in the last 100 days to allow employers to get really armed with information that would have been unthinkable a uh, hundred days ago. So I worry that uh, at, 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 as we progress in this homework blurring, that it's going to be bad, I think, for the souls and the psyches of employees. Excellent points. Uh, Derek, anything that you'd like to contribute to that, uh, to that point as well? Sure. So uh, welcome, everybody, and, and thanks for coming on today. Um, uh, Brian has a very unique view, and, and I come from a slightly, uh, well, actually a significantly different area where my focus is coming into organizations and seeing what they're doing currently and if they're compliant with the way uh, rules and regulations have been written, and if they're not, uh, what can be done to kind of help them out. So that's kind of how I was looking at this first question. And what I've seen across the board is when uh, systems and, and uh, organizations started shutting down or sending workers home, the ones who were already uh, remote workers like Compass uh, were in fairly good situational uh, awareness in terms of I could already work from home whenever I wanted and do what I needed to do and everything was already cloud-based so it wasn't that hard but a lot of organizations to keep running to keep up and going had to scramble and really design uh, the ability to work from home and what happens in that case is is twofold the first thing is uh, moving data back and forth it becomes very very difficult and problematic and so you can you can anticipate and figure out what sort of privacy breaches you might be bringing data home locally from your PC you might be emailing yourself data to your home PC all sorts of stuff like that just to keep things up and running um, the other thing is the experts in security and privacy suddenly found themselves hard-pressed to become IT folks again very very quickly and it was it was uh, you know, all of a sudden you have 10 people working from home and that jumps to 100. Anybody who can set up a computer or answer questions or help somebody through became a, a de facto IT person. So some of them very, very expensive help desk people. You, you, got, you got everybody from CIOs to uh, information security officers to data privacy officers telling people how to set up their email on their home PCs. Uh, so that took away from kind of the privacy focus in terms of all a lot of the new legislation like the California Privacy Act and, and GDPR and laws coming through. Uh, and then obviously with the downturn in business, assessments and incentives, uh, you know, to uh, become more compliant or become more privacy aware either got their funding cut or they were pushed off until 
uh, you know, this, they figured out how they were going to work and what they were going to do. And I'm just starting to see that come back a little bit. People are starting to ask me questions about privacy. I think a lot of local companies seem to have gotten a point where, okay, we know we're running now. We think we're okay business wise, but we know everything we've done has created a bunch of holes. So how can we fix this? So that's kind of where I come from on this question and where I see that. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Good stuff. So moving on to our next question here, and this is, a, in my opinion, an interesting one. What parallels do you see with the current pandemic and the events that followed 9-11 in terms of privacy? And Brian, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, this is an interesting question. And, and candidly, I, 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 I will, uh, this, this, this vignette or this discussion comes from a, a wonderful documentary, which I'd recommend anyone uh, on this webinar look at because you probably could be interested. It's called Terms and Conditions May Apply. Uh, I think the last time I checked, it was available on Amazon Prime. It might be on Netflix. And it, it's a wonderful documentary about how we, we never read the terms and conditions and what are the consequences of that. And in that, in that documentary, they tell a great story uh, about a bankruptcy, believe it or not, of a toy company, I think it was out of Boston, called toysmart.com. And that bankruptcy, um, the, the question in that bankruptcy was whether or not the company could sell its customer list as part of its assets in the bankruptcy. So as everyone, or you should know, uh, in bankruptcy, uh, generally you have to liquidate your assets and give the money to your creditors. And this toysmart.com had amassed a very, very valuable mailing list of customers who bought on their, on their site. And people were up in arms that the list was going to be sold. All the privacy advocates said, well, wait a second, time out. You got to keep this information confidential. And ultimately, the bankruptcy court determined that uh, the, the interest of the creditors to get that value outweighed the privacy interests of the customers of their names and addresses on the list. So this is 20 years ago. You see a collision between uh, creditor rights, right, to get their, their payment and the rights of consumers. And this caused an unbelievable level of consternation in Congress. Uh, privacy advocates were all over Capitol Hill uh, demanding um, a, a, a robust privacy law in response. And in fact, there was one proposed uh, which, which would have been sort of a, a, an enormous online privacy bill in 2001. And uh, so that was winding its way through Congress. All the privacy advocates were, were, were gung-ho. And then 9-11 happened. And on a dime, the public debate turned away from protecting privacy rights when we, and we moved into anti-terrorism mode and five weeks later, in October, we got the Patriot Act, which, if you know, the Patriot Act was basically uh, America's omnibus or big response to 9-11, because I think one of the themes of the Patriot Act is, is data gathering, and the government realized that so much private industry was gathering and storing information uh, that, that was just tremendous that the government could then tap into through FISA courts, through warrants, through surveillance, that the idea of giving uh, Americans a robust privacy bill just went out the window. So it, I teach this vignette in my class because I just find the intersection of history so fascinating. And I make the point that uh, you know Facebook and other social media companies likely would not exist in their current form uh, were it not for 9-11 because this paved, this lack of an omnibus you know, GDPR-like privacy bill in 2001 paved the way uh, to allow those, those platforms to grow. And I, and I analogize it here because uh, I'm concerned we might be experiencing deja vu all over again. Uh, and I would urge you after the webinar, if you have something in your hand to write down, I would urge you to write down what's called the Earn It Act, E-A-R-N-I-T Act. This is an act that is currently winding its way through Congress. I just checked a couple days ago, it passed a big hurdle in committee in the Senate. And this is uh, happening all while we're focused on the pandemic. And this webinar is out, it's, it, 
I don't have enough time to go through what the Earn It Act does, but it is uh, privacy advocates are very, very concerned that it would uh, erode a lot of our protections as Americans and also uh, uh, reduce the effect of encryption and really just impact all of this. And again, it's outside the scope of this webinar. I urge you to look at it because I see the same thing happening again, where everyone is focused quite appropriately, by the way, on the pandemic. Uh, but we are having still government grind on and I'm concerned that major policy decisions are happening without the attention or the long-term thought that that should go into it. And another analogy, and I'll, I'll end on this, is think about, think about plastic straws. On March 1st, we were all very concerned about disposable plastic straws and their impact on the environment. And now we have a arguable crisis over all of the plastics and the PPE and the masks that we're going to be seeing environmentally that we are not focusing on because we're so concerned about the health effects of the pandemic. And I'm not saying that's good or bad or that's wrong. I'm just pointing it out as an observation. So to answer Jeff's question and close the loop, I worry that we are uh, going to be experiencing some long-term consequences to our privacy through uh, the passage of laws that might otherwise be getting a tremendous amount of scrutiny, but we're so focused on the pandemic that we're not paying much attention. Awesome, thanks, Brian. Derek, do you have anything that you'd like to share as well on this question? I, in, in, in this sense, uh, I, I actually uh, completely agree with Brian on, on, on how the feeling uh, has, has progressed from one to the other. Uh, when I was, uh, dur during 9-11, I was actually taking a, uh, a firewall instruction course out of Checkpoint, and uh, we, were, we were in a bunker mentality, no radios, no TVs or anything. We didn't find out until we came up for lunch, believe it or not. Um, but what I remember is, it, it's the, the, is, is the difference, the, the sense of panic, the sense of what are we going to do, how are we going to you know, take care of this is very, very similar. Um, the reasons behind them, though, and, and the effect I see, a I, I see people acting a little bit differently, and I think that's probably one of the reasons is because um, the, the, what happened on 9-11, you, you heard some people saying, you know, this is a conspiracy, but by and large, the, the, the country got together, and to Brian's point, privacy was much less important than making sure uh, uh, you know, people were effective. And, and I use the TSA as an example. Nobody, for suddenly, nobody minded taking off their shoes or their belt or emptying their contents of their, their suitcases or pockets when they went through. Uh, and, and today, anything that somebody says you should do this to help with the pandemic is, is met probably with a 50-50 split, whether it's, it's the end of our way of life or the way we can save ourselves. And uh, but from a privacy standpoint, bring it you know to bring it a little bit back, is I see uh, you know I do see you know 9/11 locked a lot of things down when you know we we can't do this we have to take a look. But to Brian's point again, you were okay with the government having access to all of this because it was a terrorist threat. Uh, with the with the current uh, way that people are feeling about the government and responsiveness in general, I see a lot more pushback on that today than I did before, uh, a lot more open about my rights and, and, and things. And I think one of the other benefits is unlike 9-11 when, when they were starting to put together that Privacy Act and it kind of fell by the wayside because of things, we do also have several states and, and countries, GDPR being one, uh, the California Privacy Act, Maine just passed the Privacy Act and going through where you are able to take advantage of those and bring those up and, and they're allowing people to say, hey, I don't want you to keep my records or you have to tell me what you have on me and, and provide it to me in, in that area. So from that standpoint, uh, I, I see a little bit more of a... a response where where I got the feeling and this could be a, a measure of age too, 9-11 being uh, 20 years ago versus now uh, there's a big difference between me being 30 and me being 50 and and kind of looking at it with a different set of eyes uh, but I always got the feel I, I got the feeling that what that it was a much more united front 
then from, from a privacy standpoint, yes, we need to do what we need to do to protect the country and take care of this. And a lot of the, the stuff I get now, even, even around privacy is, do we really have to do this? Or, you know, uh, how are we going to go about this? I will, we'll do it, but I don't want to spend any money. There's a lot more pushback. And that might be the difference in my roles from 20 years ago to now as well. And, and also, just to amplify, Derek, and just briefly, because you touched on something that I've been giving a lot of thought about. Uh, and again, back to 9-11, we were able to get through that uh, as, a, as a country by coming together and by going to our churches and going and, and with our families and getting together in mourning as a country together. Well, we, we were doing the opposite to get through the pandemic. And that's, that's what I think, from a social science, human perspective is fascinating. And then the last point I'd make on government uh, and I'm a student of government, I, I, I'm a political science junkie, uh, governments aren't operating in an efficient fashion because they're not coming together. So we're having governors using their emergency powers and government lawyers drafting those executive orders, both in Rhode Island and elsewhere, all well-intentioned people, but certainly not the way government in the big picture is designed to operate long-term. And then finally, you combine those facts with the fact that this is a divisive election year, it is a crucible for a lot of collision of those values, as Derek points out, 50-50. It's very interesting. Awesome. Thank you both. And it is very interesting for sure. So let's get to what might be a little bit of a controversial question. So as we all kind of know, there's been stories in the news regarding individuals refusing to wear masks in public facilities that require them stating that they have a medical condition that prevents them from wearing a mask and that HIPAA allows them to keep any details of that condition private from the facility. Does HIPAA truly apply in these types of situations? And Derek, we'll start with you on this one. So this is probably, I, I, I don't, this is probably my most fun question out of the five, quite honestly. And it's not, it's not that it's not serious. It's not that there's not a, uh, a you know, uh, a lot of angst around this, but it really shows uh, that, that if people did a little bit of reading and people did a little bit of understanding, it, 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 you know, you could combat a lot of um, bad information that's out there if, if you do a little bit of research and just don't listen exclusively to whatever is on the news or, or whatever pundit happens to be talking. And to this, I'm going to share my screen right now. And uh, as long as I can, so those of you that are, uh, that are on and can actually see my screen, um, I've called up a couple of, uh, a, a, a couple of uh, um, uh, tags or a, a couple of pieces of paper that people are using right now that uh, in the, you know, to try and get into stores and grocery stores and restaurants saying that, you know, I have health care, you know, I have health reasons that not only do I not have to wear a mask? But you can't ask me why I don't have to wear a mask because it's illegal and I can sue you and you know, you'll get a lot of money. Uh, I'll get a lot of money out of you. Now, as politely as I can put this, this is silly nonsense and we'll go a little bit into why. So there are two main areas that people actually use to, to kind of claim they're, they're not only exempt, but I'm, you know, it, it's a privacy issue. You can't ask me this question. The first is HIPAA. And, uh, and there is a HIPAA privacy rule. Anybody who, who deals with medical information is, is aware of it. And basically the rule is to prevent companies like hospitals and, health and, and insurance companies and everything else from disclosing your healthcare information to unauthorized parties. That's the easiest way to do it. It has nothing to do with your ability to tell somebody if you have a pre-existing medical condition. And it doesn't apply what I would consider out in the wild. So as I said, it applies to health plans or clearing houses or healthcare providers. It does not apply to grocery stores. It does not apply to restaurants or BJs or things like that. Now, again, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, if you learn something about somebody's medical condition, you should call somebody up and start saying, hey, did you know, you know, so-and-so has a broken leg, so they probably won't be around. I'll use the NFL as an example. And it's very important that they don't want to disclose, you know, injuries and things like that outside of the collective bargaining agreement for just that reason. However, saying I don't have to wear a mask because of HIPAA is, is not true at all. 
and uh, and and there's nothing you know. I scoured when I saw these start coming out. I actually scoured uh, as much information as I can and looked for you know. Do, do any doctors issue these sort of rules and regulations and stuff like that? And there really wasn't anything out there. Now. Uh, not to mention the fact that most of these are done so poorly. If you look at the, the slide on the left, they've actually spelled HIPAA wrong. Um, HIPAA has, has two A's, not two P's. It's a common mistake, but it's one of those things that you want to look at. The other side of this is the ADA or the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, this is legitimate, is, is you are not supposed to prevent uh, people from, with disabilities from being able to go about and, and have the same experience that other people have. But there are, a couple of, uh, you know, there, there are a couple of things to consider there. One is that companies are supposed to take reasonable precautions you know, to, to make sure that they, they adhere to this. So a really good example would be if you actually do have an existing medical condition that prevents you from wearing a mask, um, something like COPD or, or emphysema or something else like that, where it really is a hassle. Grocery stores, and many have offered this, things like home delivery, things that says, hey, tell us what you need. We will bring stuff out to you. There, so there isn't, you know, you are making the, the reasonable effort to accommodate these people. It doesn't say that, you know, you get to do what you want because you have a pre-existing medical condition. The other thing that most people don't bring up is that if you claim, hey, under, you know, the American with Disabilities Act, I have a pre-existing condition and, and I don't have to tell you about it and I'm going to sue you. Well, you better be able to, to already have that condition uh, uh, written up and, and diagnosed by a doctor and on file as an ADA condition, or else uh, you're not only not going to get any money when you sue, more than likely you're going to be, you know, countersued and there's going to be big issues going on. So the bottom line about this is there's a lot of pushback in a lot of different places about how, you know, wearing a mask is silly. I don't have to do this. It's not my right. And, and that isn't going to end. But a couple of things to, to remember in terms of privacy, uh, uh, regulations tend to be very specific when it comes for, from, from a privacy aspect. And you want to make sure that even if you have a basic understanding of them, you're going to be able to know and, and, and it's going to help you handle certain situations where privacy is concerned. Having said that, there's a lot of issues when we get into the data and, and how you're protecting it within your company and what you're collecting. There's absolutely a lot of rules and regulations that you should be paying attention to. But in this case, it's, it's one of those things that... Uh, that the pundits and, and the people on the news and, and everything kind of go a little bit crazy about and it gets blown to way out of proportion in my opinion. Brian, I'll turn it over to you, your thoughts on this topic. Yeah, Derek, Derek nailed the, um, the hip angle. I won't, I won't belabor that point. Uh, he hit all the, the, the important pieces there. Uh, in my practice, I'll tell you, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of concerns by managers uh, and uh, upper level folks about what I, what I call mask shaming, which is the, the, the debate and the discussion about, you know, why didn't so-and-so have a mask on? Why is their nose showing? Uh, that mask does not look thick enough. It's, it's, it's exactly the type of frenetic anxiety you would expect during a pandemic. So I, I, I completely understand it. Uh, so HIPAA, as to, Derek point, as to Derek's point, really should not play much of a role if at all, in most workplaces. But the ADA, though, is important. And, yeah. and one thing I want to amplify that Derek said is the ADA covers not only people who have a disability, but also people who are perceived to have a disability. So whether they actually have the disability or whether or not they are perceived to have a disability, there is protection under the law. And so what the advice I'm giving my clients and anyone uh, who, who has this situation where an employee can't wear a mask, uh, refuses to wear a mask or otherwise struggles to wear a mask because they claim a disability. And I haven't had many. I've only, you know, maybe had a couple or three in the last few months that, that I'm aware of in the office. Uh, it, the roadmap is exactly what it would be like if the person uh, said they couldn't do something else because of a disability. The law says you can, you can, you have to engage in an interactive process with that person. So here's the advice I, I generally give, depending on the circumstances. 
let's assume that that person can't wear a mask due to a bona fide disability. Let's just assume that's the case. Let's not argue with them about whether COPD is sufficient. Let's right. not argue with them about whether their seasonal allergies is sufficient. Let's not argue with them about their contact dermatitis that they get on their face from wearing a mask. Let, let's just put all that aside for a moment. Talk to the employee, ask them, well, what can we do to accommodate you? Oh, I just don't want to wear my mask in my office, but I'll wear it in the hallways and all the other common areas. That might be a reasonable accommodation. Um, letting people work from home more often than not might be reasonable. Uh, you know, offering to buy them hypoallergenic masks, right? That might be a reasonable accommodation. So while I think the HIPAA, I don't want to say it's frivolous, but it's largely frivolous. The ADA one, you have to be more careful of because right. what, you would, what you would hate to have is a situation where someone legitimately has a problem with wearing a mask and you didn't treat them right and a court agrees that they were disabled. That's, you know, you're going to be putting your insurer on notice for that. So I think you can be confident with HIPAA and people claiming that due to HIPAA, you can't do this or that. But be careful with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And, and, and again, you, are, if a, you, you can't play top secret agent with your employer about your disabilities. You can't say, I have these mysterious disabilities and you need to accommodate me and it's su super secret. You know, I can't tell you what it is. No, there's a process that your HR department should be well aware of about getting documentation. So when you hear objections to masks and, 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 and employees bringing those issues, Put your ADA hat on and approach it in that way. Excellent. Awesome point. And thank you both. Um, before I get to the next question, I'll just remind everybody that's on the webinar. Don't forget, if you have any questions that you'd like to put into the Q&A uh, piece at the bottom, please do so. We already have one question in there. Um, but again, if anything comes up, please make sure that you, you pop those in there and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, moving on to the next question. And this is going to be a, another uh, good one too, is... Do you have any privacy concerns surrounding the new COVID-19 tracker apps that are being released? And Brian, I'll start with you on this one. I'll give you one guess. Uh, uh, so, so, so let me qualify that, that though with a lawyer's response. It depends on the app, okay? The, the, and there's so many iterations out there that uh, some are really, really good because they're thoughtful and it's done through uh, you know, hashes that are anonymized and that there's protections and um, a sunsetting of how long the data is kept. Those are all the good ones. The other ones, obviously, uh, are posing more of a concern. But I'll tell you, my biggest problem or my biggest concern with COVID tracker apps is not necessarily uh, their use during the pandemic. My bigger problem is more existential and long term of the, of the, the precedent we're setting and the concern I have over mission creep. What I mean by mission creep is that it might be entirely appropriate to have COVID tracker apps that track your location and who you Bluetooth connect with and have a, a, an algorithm that creates a mosaic of who you are and where you went and who you were next to. That might be perfectly fine during a pandemic. The problem is, is three years from now, are we going to use it during a bad flu season? Are we going to use it two summers from now when triple E or West Nile virus is hitting the Cape badly. I, that's what I most worry about. So I would caution us as users of these apps and as thinkers in this space to uh, use them uh, in a way that builds in protections that we're used to. For example, sunsetting of data. Rhode Island's COVID tracker app uh, I thought was fairly well done and thought out with a couple of exceptions. But one of the things that makes, I think, the Rhode Island app uh, uh, good is that it is designed to have data that rolls off after the utility period of that data has ended for tracking purposes. It might be 20 days. It might be some short period of time. Well, that's, that's important, right? You don't want to have a tracker app for a pandemic when the incubation period is 2 to 16 days and you have four months of someone's data on there. So I use that as an example for those who are interested in the app space, uh, look for those, uh, those short windows of data that's being kept, uh, look at the sharing policies, and obviously 
uh, where the data is resort, uh, stored. Rhode Island, for example, they tell us that it's stored locally only at all times, and then only when you push a button is it shared elsewhere. So those are the things I would look at uh, in addition to mission creep for COVID apps. Awesome. Derek, I'll let you take over. I think, and, and I've looked at the Rhode Island one as well, Brian, and I, I agree with you. I think it was, it was fairly well done. Um, and one of the things that, that I, can, I can add to that that is very important is, uh, you know, know in advance exactly what data they're collecting. And, and this is going to be a big thing in the, uh, you know, coming up as well, especially where privacy is concerned, because in many cases, you only need certain pieces of information you don't even need you know you don't you may not necessarily need enough to identify the person and and uh, you know long term or anything else like that there are plenty of applications not just the covid-19 apps but that collect uh extraneous data, data that is not necessary to the application, not to the use. With the, the privacy uh, push that has been going on, one of the first things I always advocate is in your privacy policy, be transparent. Tell whoever you're, you want to use your apps, whoever want to, to sign up for your site to do this, tell them outright exactly what you're collecting and what you're going to do with it. That's critical to, to getting the buy-in to understand because a lot of things are, are becoming a opt-in uh, uh, society instead of an opt-out, which means you have to specifically say, I agree to do this. I'm okay with you doing this. Now, you can't force everybody to read everything, although, you know, even when you put it up and things like that, uh, that, to, that goes back to Brian's terms and conditions. Uh, uh, discussion that we were having earlier in the webinar. Um, but if you are the people creating these apps and going through, one of the things you really want to map out is, is you want to have a, a plan in place is, is what are we doing? What are we collecting? What are we going to use it for? How are we going to, are we going to share it? How are we going to share it? Do we have the ability to know exactly where it is, uh, where it's going to go? And to Brian's point, are we going to get rid of it? Uh, those are all, uh, now we, we take a little bit, the app could be a very, you know, applications are usually neutral. Some you can say are good or bad or ugly, but applications are neutral depending on how you use it. And, and to, to Brian's point about scope creep is if you have a data set, you can make an application that can use the data for just about anything. So you really want to be cognizant of what data you're, you're turning into people, when it's going to get rid of, you know, when it's going to leave that, uh, that app or that database and, uh, and how you can see what it's there, uh, you know, what, what they've collected and what it is. And just one, one uh, tidbit uh, to end on this question. I'll get to an example of the technology that's out there. There's a product, it's called Arista Flow, A-I-R-I-S-T-A -I -I Flow. I have an article about it in front of me. And it's basically a, uh, a bracelet that is a real-time tracker for employees to use in different settings. And I'll just read one sentence. When people come within six feet of each other, the device makes an audible chirp. So that sounds tremendously helpful to me that if people are going to get too close together in a workspace, there's going to be a chirp. That's fantastic. But think about from a pandemic perspective. Yep. But think about me as an employment lawyer who does sexual harassment investigations. I'd love to have all the data where all the employees were at all times. So if I have to do a sexual harassment investigation a year from now, that's what I worry about with Mission Creek. Awesome point by both of you. And that's excellent. And uh, I don't know about you guys and for the folks that are listening to the webinar as well or, or viewing the webinar, anytime I hear the word tracker app, I automatically start to get nervous, but that's a whole, it's a whole different story. Um, let's go to the next question here. And this one is going to be awesome, especially with everything that's going on with the pandemic and, and the reopening of, of uh, states and governments and uh, workplaces, of course. How can employers minimize their data privacy risks throughout the pandemic and the reopening of uh, workplaces and states? And Derek, we'll start with you. So the good news about this is uh, before, before the pandemic, there were more and more organizations and, and, and countries and states that, that were considering this very question because they consider it a, a real issue going through. Um, 
starting, you know, HIPAA was kind of, we, we all kind of joke about HIPAA because it's, I call it privacy light. They want you to do some stuff. There's not a lot of really strong enforcement or, or stringent stuff. They can do, you know, they, you, you've seen HIPAA violations, you've seen fines and stuff like that. But most of the, uh, most of the recommendations are, are very, very high level. So you can get down into, uh, you know, uh, things like GDPR, which is the European privacy one, where any data that you collect, anything from IP address, uh, to locate, you know, geolocation, things like that, those can all be considered private data by GDPR, depending on how stringent you want them to be. And now the states themselves, the California Privacy Act, the Maine, um, it, Massachusetts has always had Mass 201 CMR 17, which deals with uh, deals with privacy um, going forward. Uh, and and everybody's talking about a, na a, a United States, a national privacy law to, to make that stuff going. So, but universally, there, there are some things to take a look at. Uh, the first thing is, uh, you know, know, and, and we talked about, I talked about this a little bit in the last question, know what data you're collecting and, and why you're collecting it. And if you don't need it, don't collect it. It's, it's just that easy. I've seen databases that, that go, you know, A through Z and then AA through ZZ, and they have 300 different uh, uh, 300 different fields. And I say, well, what is all this for? Oh, well, we just collect as much as we can. And that was the old way of thinking is big data. The more you get, the better it is. And, and the more data you have, the more things you can run, the more things you, and, and which is all true, but the more things you can breach as well. And the more stuff that gets a, you know, the, the, that can cause problems. So figure out what you're doing. And, and if you can't, if you can limit the data you're collecting to what you're using. Um, to Brian's earlier point, how long are you going to keep it? This is a huge thing. If you have data out there that's, you know, 5, 10, 15 years old, that's a lot of data that you may or may not need. And I find this not only in, in electronic format, but physical format. When I do clean desk walkthroughs and things like that, I find stuff from 10 years ago and I asked the person, I said, when was the last time you opened this? Well, I never opened it. And yet if somebody came because your door, your drawers are unlocked and I took this and walked out, I have all sorts of information on your company that is going to be, you know, horrible. Um, or, or your cut to, to Brian's earlier point, your customer base, uh, you know, you never used it. It was from 10 years ago, but I have who bought what, what their credit card numbers were, all sorts of things like that. Um, so if you're, uh, are you able, and this is a new one coming, coming forward, one of the things that all the privacy laws are, are starting to enact is, um, if, uh, is, is not only about consent, which is I agree to allow you to use this data, but um, do you know where the, you know, can you provide me with what data you've collected me? And is there a right to erasure, i.e., can you get rid of it? If I ask you, I say, I don't want to use your service anymore. I don't want to be associated with you. Uh, you know, and there are, um, there are caveats to that, i.e., if you've signed up for this and agreed to let me use this data for this, it doesn't mean that everything gets erased. You can't erase things from government databases, stuff of that nature. Um, but by and large, it wants to give the consumer uh, the ability to say, okay, what do you, you know, what have you collected on me and what are you using it for? Um, we talked about don't keep in it longer till you need to. Um, the other thing that's, that's very, very popular, especially in when, when people are doing um, big data is if you don't need the specifics of the data, can you scrub it? So you can no longer identify the person any longer. In a lot of cases, the big data stuff, they're looking for relationships across states or, or countries or counties or types of business or schools or things like that, but you don't need to identify individuals. So if you can protect that data by scrubbing anything that's in an individual tag and just using it for um, either households or marketing or things like that, you're, it's going to be, then it's not a privacy risk anymore. Then it's just generalized statistics. And that makes it a lot easier to protect that data than if you have uh, my social security number and everything that I bought, for example. So I'll let Brian go uh, uh, speak to that a little bit as well. 
Sure, I I'm gonna be brief because I know we're coming up against time. I just wanna add a couple things. Uh, just to go full circle with what I started the presentation discussing about the dignity of, of, of your employees. Uh, I, I would just emphasize that as you're communicating these policies with your employees that you be transparent and start to explain why you're doing what you're doing. I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, my firm, my law firm, for example, you know, we have fairly strict policies about mask wearing and, you know, everything sort of well-intentioned. But the one that really got my attention was uh, learning that um, representatives of either the Department of Health or the Department of Business Regulation will be making spot checks at Rhode Island employers throughout the state to determine compliance with all the regulations. Well, that's a tremendous motivator to me as an employee because I want my employer to pass whatever government inspection happens. Well, that makes good sense to me that maybe this is why I should wear a mask. Maybe this is why I should uh, answer truthfully to the health questionnaires because that's the reason. So rather than just dictating terms or rules to your employees, uh, enter a dialogue with them about why. And then the last point is I would urge you, because I'm starting to see it in my practice uh, as well, remember to not treat your employees as threats or infection vectors or sources of expense. They're people. Uh, and we start to think of people in terms of uh, dehumanizing them. And I worry in the pandemic that we're starting to do that uh, and be flexible and maybe relax attendance policies and, and encourage remote working. Uh, so I would end on that note that, that I think employees are struggling uh, in the new environment and that us as, as either business owners or managers, uh, we need to take that into account. Awesome. Great points. And thank you to you, to you both. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask the attendees again, if you, this is probably the third time and you guys are probably sick of hearing me say this, but if you have any questions, we're at the end of the questions that, that originally were on the agenda to discuss and now we're going to open it up to some Q&A type stuff. So we do have a couple questions in there. So if you do have any questions uh, that you'd like to ask, please make sure that you put them in uh, to the Q&A section at the bottom. So we'll get to the first question here and it comes from Ed and uh, his question is, what are, uh, top, what are top keys to successfully implementing an intelligent data privacy solution? And uh, Derek, I'll start with you on that one. I have a problem with the word intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> Fair um, enough. However, uh, it's uh, basic stuff is, is, is you have to understand, um, your data so that you can protect it both physically and logically and, and what you're collecting and how you're going through. So if you're looking for a data privacy solution, you have, you know, you want to, you want to be able to protect it from a confidential standpoint, but you want to be able to uh, uh, query it, know where it is, know what it is, um, and, and be able to provide that data back to the people who have given it to you if they asked for it. Uh, many, one, one of the big roadblocks currently to the privacy laws are there are a lot, a lot of legacy systems out there that do not lend themselves to uh, providing a, a way to show people, show customers easily what's been collected on them, how long they've had it, and what they do with it. So they're running into, they're, they're having to do things in a very manual basis. And in fact, some of the requests for privacy, um, when, when you make a request, they're giving companies 30 days to be able to get that information back to the customer just because there's no easy way to be able to do that. So going forward, one of the things that I always say to look at is if you were building this, if you were taking a look at this, you know, uh, identify the data, identify what it is, where it is, how it's being used, and be able to, you know, be able to give that back to anybody who asks for it. Awesome. Brian, is there anything that you want to add or share on that topic? No, I'll leave it at that. Derek covered it. All right. Beautiful. Uh, next question comes from Phil. If we collect the standard COVID information, symptoms, temperature, et cetera, for citizens entering into our buildings, must the storage of that data adhere to all HIPAA regulations? And Brian, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me parse that out. So let me assume, first of all, that the, um, that, the, that the building that you're referring to or the place of business 
is not a hospital or a doctor's office. Uh, let's assume that we're talking about a regular office building uh, and you're gathering. And, and in fact, it happened to me yesterday. I went somewhere and I was asked all those questions about, um, I didn't get my temperature take, taken, but I've got, got asked the other questions. And I saw the person and writing it down on a clipboard and uh, along with other information. That entity that I went to is not subject to HIPAA. So I would not worry or suggest that you need to lock that down in a way that Rhode Island Hospital has to lock down their system. So, and if this was legal advice, I'd be emailing you, Phil, an invoice. So don't take this at as, as legal advice. Um, but that being said, I, I warn you though, Rhode Island has a tremendously liberal, broad privacy statute that allows people to sue for breach of privacy. So my, my, if I was to give legal advice, I would say you should protect that list and that information and that data, just like you would other sensitive data. I would not leave it on a clipboard at the security desk and have people fill out the answers when they could read everyone else's answers on the list. I would not have them do that. So the answer, Phil, to your question is you don't need to follow HIPAA on that but you want to use best practices to protect the information. Um, uh, you know, to, to Derek's point before, only ask what you need to. Uh, con you'll never go wrong doing what the government suggests you do. So only ask those questions about travel and exposure. Go to the CDC's website, Rhode Island Department of Health's website and follow that model. Don't make up your own. Don't talk to your aunt who's a nurse who thinks that you should be asking these questions. You know, you should be asking only the questions that the government suggests, and and I think you'd be you'd be protected. So to answer your question, HIP is not going to be a problem in that case. Totally awesome. agree. Anything you want to add to that, Derek? Sorry. Uh, and and in terms of protecting the data, it's, it's spot on. If you're making people write stuff down, lock it up in a drawer. Um, make sure it's inaccessible to anybody who doesn't need it. And when you're done with it, if you're, if you're doing this because it's a, you know, you're asking questions to allow people in the door and, and you don't need it more than the end of the day, buy a shredder. Shred it, you know, if it's a physical thing you're writing down, throw it right in the shredder and, and call it a day and then you don't have to worry about it. A lot of people just throw stuff in the drawer and say, I'll get to it when I get to it. That's, that's one of the big issues that are, that are out there. If you don't need it, shred it and start tomorrow fresh, and then you're not worried about HIPAA or anything else, quite honestly. And that's an important point. And I've started to see the Department of Health come out with statements on this uh, about how long these logs need to be kept. It's obviously being kept for con contact tracing pur purposes. And I would expect in the next month or so, we'll start to see some very clear deadlines by which you need to keep this stuff and you don't need to keep it anymore. Uh, because it's going to be such an administrative burden if it isn't already that you're going to have storage issues and security issues. Um, so just keep an eye out for how the best practices on those. And I tell my clients all the time, I said, listen, if you make a mistake, but it's an honest, well-intentioned mistake and you followed the best government advice and you did your best, but you were wrong, I can win that case in court. I can't win. You did nothing. I can't win. You decided not to. I can't win the fact that you thought it was stupid, so you didn't do it. I can't win those cases. So I would urge you just to do your best uh, and make your best honest judgment. Uh, I don't see any other questions in there, so I'm going to assume at this point in time that nobody has any additional questions. So uh, I'll take the opportunity to say thank you to Brian. Uh, I know that you're busy. Appreciate you taking the time to, to share some time with us today and lend your expertise on these uh, privacy issues. Uh, Derek, thank you as well. I know that you're busy as well and appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to share your expertise as well. And I hope that everyone found this uh, very informative uh, and beneficial to navigating these kind of unique times that we're in. So without further ado, I'll close out the webinar. Appreciate everybody. Thank you everybody for attending and taking the time. And we look forward to uh, hopefully chatting with you in the near future. Thank Take you care, so much, everybody. everybody. Thank, you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Jeff.